Well, now, really, when we go back then to falling in love and say it's crazy, falling, you see, we don't say rising into love. There is in it the idea of the fall. There is always a curious tie at some point between the fall and the creation. Love, an intense feeling of deep affection. I don't think that this definition is doing justice to what love means. There is something more to it. Let's see what the psychologist Abraham Maslow has to add to this. He came up with the hierarchy of needs, also called the pyramid of needs. And when he's talking about real love, he's talking about the so-called being love. Now, to make sense out of that, we need to understand his pyramid of needs first. Basically, this pyramid describes how motivation and needs of humans evolve throughout their development. The very fundamental need of any human being is a physiological need. The need to have enough food, water, sleep, you're motivated to satisfy those, and as soon as you manage that, you are concerned with the next level of needs, the safety needs. You strive to have a safe place to live and a stable job that provides you with security. After having all this, you start to cultivate the need for belonging and feeling connected. You're looking for friends, even a partner maybe. And it doesn't stop here. As soon as you feel a sense of belonging, you want more. You also want recognition and respect from others. You want to feel worthy and build a strong self-esteem. And only then, if all those needs are roughly satisfied, you start to really focus on your self-actualization. You start to ponder who you really are and how you can express yourself authentically. Not only this, you also start to perceive life different. Right here at the self-actualization stage, true love begins. Being love, and also called higher love. Every love below that stage can be considered to be a deficiency love. In all those stages below, you feel incomplete. You're looking for something external, outside of yourself. You really need a safe place. You really need others to include you and respect you. You are having a deficiency and you're trying to fill it. In this state of mind, love is simply a means to an end. It helps you to feel worthy and good enough. It provides you with a sense of safety. You love the other person for what you get. It is rather selfish. In contrast, when you're trying to truly self-actualize, you're not trying to fill any hole. You feel good about yourself. You start to love something or somebody because it's simply love worthy. This love is much more about giving. It's much more accepting because you don't need your partner to be or act in any specific way to satisfy your needs because you are already satisfied. You already feel good about yourself and you simply want the best for the other. It tends to be an unconditional love. I would like to share a short clip of Abraham Maslow himself talking about it. That is higher love, lower love. And I've spoken about be as in being, being love, meaning love for the being of the other, by contrast with deficiency love, which means love for the purveyor of basic need gratifications. Uh, the one who applauds you, you love in that sense. Uh, this other one, the higher love for the, uh, the more pure love, whether in a person... Um, your wife or your husband or your child or your friend, uh, I think it can be best exemplified as for the kind of admiration it is and love for the quality of the, per of the other person. It comes close to admiration and so on. 
And being loved doesn't mean that you don't need anything and you're perfectly fine if your girlfriend is breaking up with you. No, it still hurts, but on a different level. Now, if you still feel a sense of neediness within you, maybe just a little bit, you might wonder, how do I fully transition to this higher love, to this being love? And well, it's rather simple. You just gratify your lower needs. In the first world countries, people usually have met their physiological and safety needs quite well. And they're somewhere between their belonging needs and self-esteem needs, which is really holding them back from experiencing true love. And how to overcome this and satisfy this need for belonging and especially self-esteem, that's a whole nother topic. I actually shot another documentary about this topic here. I want to rather focus mainly on love. So I was wondering, how do people really feel about this topic? Have you ever loved? Oh, okay. Um, I guess so. I'd say so. I don't know. I've liked a lot and I've liked very much. Um, but I don't know if that, if that is love. Have you ever loved? Yes, I did. <laughs> Yes, I have. Um, we just broke up like three weeks ago, so that's not one of the topics I would like to talk about right now, but yeah, I did. And it was amazing though, it really was. Yes, I have, I do have a boyfriend. Um, yeah, I've loved someone for quite a long time. It took me a long time to get over it as well. Uh, two years to be honest. No. Oh yes, of course, I do. <laughs> um, I don't think you can talk about love if you're that young, but I think you experience a kind of love. Um, but I think you have to, to grow a lot older and uh, collect experiences to talk really about love. Yeah, I did. Once or twice. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, who doesn't love somebody or something? Yes, a lot, and also in very different ways. And I think a nice love is a love where you um, are in a very balanced position, and you can really give that love to the person. And I think. The circumstances in different loves differ, but um, if you're lucky, you find yourself in a position where you're loving and you can also give it to the person and it becomes a nice thing. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say it was love, it was like something close maybe, but on the other hand, I don't really know what love is. I think you will know what love is when you are in love. So, no. What we don't know from those people is whether they are talking about being love or deficiency love. We simply don't know. The people in the interview were still rather young. Abraham Maslow himself talked about the fact that the younger people are still more likely to fall for the deficiency love, simply because they're still gratifying their basic needs. And the older you become, the more likely at least it is that you're closer to self-actualization and therefore more likely to fall for the being love. Now, to wrap up this topic and distinguishment between being love and deficiency love, I would love to show you a last story by Abraham Twertsky about fish love. It was a young man who was clearly enjoying a dish of fish that he was eating. And he said, uh, young man, why are you eating that fish? And the young man says, because I love fish. He says, oh, you love the fish. That's why you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. He said, don't tell me you love the fish. You love yourself. 
and because the fish tastes good to you, therefore you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. Falling in love is not something that you do with everybody. It seems like everybody has their certain preferences. So what is your preference? Some people say that the opposite attracts, others say that people are more drawn towards similarities and research is quite clear about that. Similarities attract. I mean, imagine you're standing on a party talking to a guy or a girl and you realize, oh, you don't like reading books? Well, I love reading books. Oh, but you play chess and I don't, that's great. You would probably not say something like that. But if you talk to somebody and you realize you both are speaking German, you both love coffee and you love traveling and backpacking, that's great, that connects. Probably you will meet up for a coffee next week. So similarities is always something that is the foundation of bonding and connection. If it's a friendship or a partnership, it, it doesn't matter. And yes, some things are complementary. For example, you're in a partnership and you realize, oh, the one person would love to have a career and go out and bring home most of the money and the other person would love to raise the kids. Perfect. There's some complementarity here, but generally similarity attracts. So it's very important also that you know yourself. Who are you? Also, what are your core values? If you value freedom and personal growth, I think it's beneficial if your partner do, do does so too. Let's say you want to travel maybe once a year for a week on your own because you love this freedom part. If your partner also values freedom, he or she will understand that. She or he won't be jealous about it. And if your values are totally different, there will be quite some friction. And it's the same with what makes you feel loved. Gary Chapman, he shared in his book, The Five Love Languages, the idea that there are basically five main channels how you communicate love. And we all have those within us, it just depends how strong and how much we value them, what's our priority also here. Some people value very much physical touch, uh, which is not only about sex, it can be just about a loving hug or just touching the other's shoulder. Others really value words of affirmation, giving a compliment, saying something positive, the verbal part is very important here. Others love receiving gifts. You might say how superficial, which just points towards the fact that you don't value this love language so much. And it doesn't mean that you don't like gifts, you still like them, but it depends how much do you feel loved if you receive a gift. Others love the acts of service. If somebody is doing something for you, cooking something for you, for example, do you feel loved by that? And the last love language is about quality time. Spending time together, focused time, high quality time, having a dinner together and talking and really focusing on your partner or traveling together. Knowing about this concept and knowing about your love languages can be very insightful. And also if you have already a partner to double check what are your love languages, what are his or her love languages. So I'm challenging you to sit down and prioritize those five love languages and rate them on a scale from one to 10. How much do you feel loved by each love language? There is, for example, Olivia and Jane. And Olivia complains, you only touch me, but never really tell me that you love me. Obviously, Jaden's love language is physical touch, but Olivia's is words of affirmations. They don't know that. But after figuring this out, Jaden will much more often tell Olivia how he feels. Or let's imagine Olivia's love language would be receiving gifts. Would Jane mind to once in a while go to a shop and buy flowers to show Olivia his love? Yes, it's maybe not his prior love language, but he can express it in a way that Olivia receives the message that Jane would like to convey. And in the beginning, when everybody's in love, usually everybody shares all love languages. You give gifts, you hug, you talk, you spend quality time and all kinds of things. But over time, after this passion declines a little bit, this is when the authentic love languages 
come up and this is then when sometimes some friction is coming up. Now, to trust oneself to be capable of love, to bring up love, in other words, to uh, function in a sociable way and in a creative way, is to take a risk. It's a gamble. Because you may not come through with it. And in the same way, when you fall in love with somebody else, or you form an association with somebody else, and you trust them, they may, as a matter of fact, not fulfill your expectations. But that risk has to be taken. The alternative to taking that risk is much worse than trusting and being deceived. You have to take risks. There will be disappointments and failures and disasters as a result of taking these risks. But in the long run, it will work out. My point is that if you don't take them, the results will be so much worse than any kind of wild anarchy that could be conceived. So taking the risk to fall in love and this crazy feeling of being in love and feeling like in heaven the first couple of months is not there to stay, it's there to pass. Actually, also from a neuroscientific perspective, you can see that after around eight months, it's totally normal that this is wearing off slowly. This passion in the very beginning is decreasing over time. And some people misinterpret that and think, oh, what is going on with this relationship? I think it's not true love, but love is just changing. So that actually just means that you're stepping it up to the next level. Actually, Robert Sternberg, he introduced the triangle of love and he states that real love is actually composed out of three aspects and the first aspect is the passion this fire this intenseness this romantic and sexual attraction that is there especially in the beginning and it's still there after years i mean that would be optimal but not as strong as it is the first couple of months and that's totally normal another aspect is the intimacy feeling attached, close and connected to somebody, really liking somebody. And according to Sternberg, yes, commitment is also one out of those three parts of love. It means being loyal, making short-term but also long-term decisions together and plan the future. Commitment is a crucial aspect to make love work on the long-term. You know, love is, is an incredible thing, and we don't know love like we should. We always talk about, I have unconditional love. Unconditional love is, we don't even know it, because if a person stops stimulating us, we stop loving them. You're not interesting to talk to anymore. Goodbye. But that real love, that love that sometimes is difficult, <laughs> difficult to have, that's that love. What Lauren Hill here says about commitment also reminds me a little bit of this deficiency love we talked in the beginning, that you need something, you need to get stimulated, you need some feeling. And if you don't get that, you're not committed anymore. So if you're experiencing this being love, it's much more easier also for you to commit because you don't need anything. And if you don't get this, you're not committed anymore. No, you tend to be more loyal and not in a needy and attached sense, but more in a totally different and more mature sense. Now, depending on the combinations of those three aspects, there can be also different types of love. If there's only passion involved, it's called an infatuated love. This means when you're having a crush on somebody or they are solely a sexual relationship. If there's only intimacy, it can be considered to be a friendship, a really deep friendship that you have with somebody. And if there's only commitment involved, it is an empty love. If there's a couple already married for 30 years, but they're unhappy about everything, there's nothing left but the contract of marriage itself. There's no intimacy, no passion only commitment. Though there can be also some combinations such as intimacy and passion 
that's called a romantic love. There's no commitment yet, but you like each other and you're also really passionate about each other and you're connecting also on a sexual level. That's a romantic love. If there is commitment and intimacy involved, it can be called a companionated love. This is also once in a while a long-term marriage where there's no passion anymore, but you like each other and there's commitment and that's fine. And if there's only commitment and passion, it can be called a fatuous love. That often happens if people get married very, very quickly. So there is commitment and they basically married because of the passion that they have. So there is this passion, but over a couple of weeks and months, they realize, oh, there's no intimacy. I actually don't like this person. So they get divorced rather quickly again. According to Sternberg, you need all three aspects, passion, intimacy, commitment, to experience this real love, also called consummate love. And according to him as well, it is easier to achieve that, but it's much harder to maintain that. It is quite a journey to make love work. But if you should be so fortunate, as to encounter either of these experiences, it seems to me to be a total denial of life to refuse it. Well, now, really, when we go back then to falling in love and say it's crazy, falling, you see, we don't say rising into love. There is in it the idea of the fall. And uh, it is, goes back, as a matter of fact, to extremely fundamental things. That there is always a curious tie at some point between the fall and the creation. Taking this ghastly risk uh, is the condition of there being life. You see, for all the life, is an, an act of faith and an act of gamble. E, the moment you take a step, you do so on an act of faith because you don't really know that the floor is not going to give under your feet. The moment you take a journey, what an act of faith. The moment you enter into any kind of human undertaking in relationship, what an act of faith. See, you've given yourself up. But this is the most powerful thing that can be done. Surrender. See, and love is an act of surrender to another person. Total abandonment. I give myself to you. Take me, do anything you like with me. That's quite mad, because you see, it's letting things get out of control. All sensible people keep things in control. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Security, vigilance, watch it. Police, watch it. Guards, watch it. Who's going to watch the guards? <laughs> so, actually, therefore, the, the, the course of wisdom, what is really sensible, uh, is to let go, uh, is to commit oneself, to give oneself up, and that's quite mad. So we come to the strange conclusion that in madness lies sanity.